Hi guys. So what I'm going to try to do is go through some of the PowerPoints on um, <clears throat> the chapter on lifespan, uh, chapter nine. So what I recommend you do, instead of just staring at my face, which I wouldn't like even if you did that in class, is um, follow along on your chapter nine PowerPoints. So I'm going to go over quickly a few of these and then I'm going to really focus on today um, Eric Erickson's stages of um, psychosocial development. Eric Erickson is interesting to study in, L in development because his theories kind of cover the entire lifespan. Um, you'll hear things in the background. Uh, hopefully my dog won't bark. I can already hear the neighbors, but um, this is uh, a good way to kind of follow along um, at home and uh, follow along in the PowerPoints, okay? So chapter nine PowerPoints, um, of course, it starts with uh, some basic terminology that you need to know in the beginning. There are videos that go with this chapter as well, and I might like kind of briefly describe those, but just wanna start out like I do every chapter with a basic definition of developmental psychology. Um, the chapter covers developmental psychology, that is from conception to death. Um, in a course like this, we're just doing a little um, small section of it, but um, you know, if you were taking this over a longer semester, and I say this a lot, um, you would you know, really drill down into the theories more like child development, adolescent development, you know, middle, late, uh, adulthood, and in, into death and dying. But in this chapter, we're just, um, the, the textbook covers the whole lifespan, but we're just going to hit some high points. Um, so the formal defi definition, and we're on um, the slides in the PowerPoints now, look at the one that has uh, the definition of developmental psych. It refers to a branch of psychology that studies how people change and grow and decline over the lifespan. Um, when we talk about growth, lifespan growth and development, um, we talk about up to a certain age where our bodies uh, physically um, stop developing and growing uh, plateau and then decline. Um, some theorists say that the only thing that continues to grow are things like intellect and wisdom and emotional control. I mean, really good parts of who you are and your personality can continue to thrive, but physically we peak as human beings around 18 to 20 years old, um, which can be depressing depending on how old you are and how much you realize your body is declining. One of the things we talked about and, and we do talk about in psychology is the nature versus nurture debate or, but really it's not a debate. Forgive me for drinking water once in a while. I need to be able to do that and my dog's in the room. Um, nature versus nurture says that we are, of course, uh, we develop on a path of nature, which is our genetics, which are set for us um, you know, when conception, when egg meets sperm, and we have those 23 pairs of chromosomes, and it's that recipe for who we're gonna be on that DNA level. And then we have the nurture side, which is our influences from our biological mother's pregnancy to what they ate and what they were exposed to. That's nurture. That's the environment. And then, of course, our birth experience, um, our first few years of life, our our, what you know caregivers how they interacted with us how they bonded to us um, you know child experiences all throughout the rest of your life anything outside of that biology is considered your nurture but there's a third factor and there's a good TED talk on this called epigenetics and it's basically um, part of the science that looks at how our genetics adapt and change a lot quicker than they did in the past or they can change from one generation to the next depending on the effects that the environment has on your genetics almost like immediate effects okay so there is a chart with stages from um, that kind of indicates ages in class I like to start to talk a, a little bit about these not spend too much time but just kind of identify the terms prenatal that's conception to birth that is roughly four week, 40 weeks of um, prenatal development. And again, at that point, that's when um, whatever the biological uh, mother 
is consuming or exposed to can affect the way that development unfolds. It is just so important to me and that you share this with people that you love that if you're pregnant, it's good to know early on that you're pregnant. It's good to treat your body in the healthiest way possible because you're building organs and especially the brain that's going to be affected by what you do during your pregnancy or your child, your, your child will be affected for the rest of their lives. Um, how they learn, how they think, emotional control, um, on and on and on. So it, it can't be stressed enough how important that is. So um, prenatal is conception to birth. Infancy is birth to two years. When an infant starts moving, crawling and walking, they, you know, considered maybe to uh, referred to as toddlers. Um, then you have early childhood, which are the preschool years, two to six years. Middle childhood, six to 12. It's interesting pattern of middle adulthood and middle childhood, the least amount of change and growth, um, uh, like physically, because you see such a physical uh, change in an infant until, um, I don't know, about like second grade. And then you have kind of like a, a more like uh, latent period of less physical change. You know, if you, if you look at your uh, school pictures, if you like lined them up, which would be a fun little project, but seeing where you change physically the most, um, you know, starting as an infant to about six years old is probably a huge change. Six to prepubescent before puberty, not a big change. That's middle childhood. And then you see a big change again in adolescence and adulthood. So, um, but in middle adulthood, it's kind of the same. You have, you know, somebody who pretty much looks a certain way, um, except, you know, with the exception of big life changes, major, you know, weight gain or weight loss, but you might see an individual look pretty similar if you set up their pictures from, I don't know, like 35 to 55, middle adulthood. Um, late adulthood is 65 years to death. If you were studying this on a developmental level, <clears throat> you would look at late adulthood into micro stages like um, old, 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 and oldest old. Those are three stages during late adulthood that really indicate more, you know, the type of person you are in late adulthood, how healthy you are, how vibrant you are, how physically fit you are. And that can um, vary um, completely separate from your chronological age, depending on how you took care of yourself, especially in your early 20s. Um, and late teens, early 20s, how you took care of your skin. Did you smoke or did you, didn't, did you not smoke? Um, drinking, um, exercise, diet, stress, sleep, all those factors that a lot of my students are experiencing in the stage right now, young adulthood, the way you take care of yourself now will make a big difference in how you age later. But it's so hard for people to think long-term like that. Um, you know, I'm no poster child of health, but there are certain things that advice that was given to me that I would give to my um, students if they want to age in a healthier way. Things like sunscreen and moisturizer on your skin every day. Men and women should moisturize their face and their neck and their chest and their hands, anything that's exposed to the sun on a daily basis. Um, things like don't smoke, smoking ages you, uh, tanning ages you. Um, you know, bad diet ages you, weight gain and, and the wear and tear it has on your bones and um, your joints. Those things can age you quickly as you get older or those things are environmentally, um, you're able to impact them based on your decisions younger in life. All right, so um, late adulthood would, would be a 55 year old could be considered oldest old if they're homebound and they can't get around and they have a lot of health problems like diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, but you can be 85 and be um, very active and very mentally alert. So that's when those environmental impacts kind of take a toll later. Just a little bit of advice because it's hard to have a crystal ball, but we know through science that there's things you can do when you're younger to, to age better. All right. So I'm going to skip through um, the research and the prenatal development in general. There are videos that I think do a great job of kind of walking you through the um, conception um, process, uh, women and their cycles, puberty, all those things that are extremely necessary um, for prenatal development. And um, also there's some um, a good slide on just some basic overview of biology terms to know like chromosomes, genes, and DNA. Um, those 23rd chromosome 
uh, pair, chromosomal pair. So 23 from the biological mother, 23 from the biological father. Make up who you are for the moment of um, the sperm and the ovum connecting and that DNA is determined. But on that 23rd pair, if you look at the next slide, uh, it shows kind of a you know, biological diagram of the 23 pairs of chromosomes and how they match up from the mother and the father. But on that 23rd pair, one of the things we talk about in development is the XY chromosome. So on the 23rd pair, the X and Y look very different. Um, there's some really interesting information about um, genes that are carried on the female's X chromosomes passed down to their son. Um, there are more genes on the X chromosome than there is on the Y. But on that 23rd pair, if your um, mother, who only can contribute an X or an X, um, contributes her X, of course, um, and then the father on that 23rd pair contributes a Y, then you're having a son. If you're an XY combination, um, you're having, uh, you have a male on that 23rd chromosome, that's the sex of the child, a male, XY. And then if your mom, of course, contributes the X and the father contributes an X, because he can carry an X and a Y, if he contributes the X, then you have a female on that 23rd chromosomal pair. There are some um, variations to this, chromosomal abnormalities um, that you would get into a lot in a biology or genetics class. All right, so anytime I bring something like that up and I can't really go off on tangents and I shouldn't on the video, but um, just you know, pause a second and look up sex chromosomal abnormalities. I mean, it's fascinating. You might get lost in some of the information out there that's interesting. All right, so then I have a slide on epigenetics. It's a TED Talk. Um, it's like I said, it's the study of cellular mechanisms that control the way your genes are expressed. It's kind of that nature-nurture combination. We know that there's some data on things like tobacco use in adolescence and um, uh, trauma and things of that nature can affect epigenetics on a shorter, short-term scale. So um, if you have time, um, watch a TED talk, TED talk on TED epigenetics. It's only five minutes long. Then we get to prenatal development. So um, there are um, a, uh, there's a lot of things that happen as a woman goes into labor. There's three stages of labor, um, but once the um, newborn is delivered, it it um, starts its human development path. But before that. We have what's called prenatal development, before birth development. So um, it's again a roughly a 40 week span, even though really you're pregnant for 38 weeks if you go full term. Um, pregnancy is determined, the date is the last day of your le last menstrual cycle. Um, even though that's probably not the day that you got pregnant, it was within the two weeks after that. Um, but that's how they start. They do 40 weeks from the last day of your last menstrual cycle. That's how they try to try to determine your um, the day that you're going to deliver or potentially go into labor. So um, the prenatal stages, conception is just when the sperm penetrates the ovum um, and it's after it's been fertilized, it's called a zygote. And that zygote, um, that fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. So um, if you go back to that diagram with the um, different video clips, the short clips uh, on cycles, prenatal and fertilization, there is a diagram of the um, female internal biological system uh, where you can see there's ovaries on either side. Uh, those ovaries contain um, eggs. Uh, I think it's a, a, a fun fact is that a newborn baby girl um, is born with all their potential eggs in their ovaries that they'll ever have in a lifetime. And it's not until um, the biological change of puberty occurs that an egg starts being released into the fallopian tubes. And then it's something called menopause when the eggs stop being released. Um, during that time of puberty through menopause is when um, a woman is most likely, you know, in a, well, is, is able to have uh, a pregnancy. So you have the ovaries, you have uh, hundreds of thousands of eggs, an egg is released every other ovary, every other month during uh, the beginning of puberty. 
and then it's released one at a time, like I said, every other month in the into the fallopian tube. So it's in the fallopian tube itself where um, fertilization occurs. So if there is no sperm in the area, then that uh, egg is gonna travel down um, through the fallopian tube, through the uterus, the little triangle shape, if you're looking at the same slide I'm looking at, um, organ, and then is flushed out with a menstrual cycle once a month as this process you know, happens over and over and over. However, if there are sperm and a sperm gets all the way to the fallopian tube, which if you watch your video, thousands and thousands of them will, some go to the wrong fallopian tube, some go to the one where the egg is, and the egg is traveling in that tube in that for that two week time period, then if an egg and a sperm combine and fertilization occurs, then now is considered a blastocyst. And so that blastocyst now travels down the tube into the uterus and if it's a healthy, viable pregnancy, it will attach to the uterine lining. The, the lining has, um, that endometrial lining has built up with blood and tissue ready to house a pregnancy and then it can and it begins to grow there and if it goes full term um, in about 38 weeks is when uh, a woman will go into labor and that uterus area is stretched out to house the stages of the baby and then birth occurs either through c-section or a vaginal birth through the birth canal those are a fun little diagram okay so then we go back to our little prenatal development stages skip down a few Conception, zygote, then the germinal period, the first two weeks after conception in the tube, and then it travels. Once it travels and attaches to the uterus, then it's the embryonic period. And you will hear the um, it, it being referred to as the embryo. Um, that's week three to week eight after conception. So it's about two months into pregnancy and you're already out of the embryonic period. Um, two weeks, the first two months, attached in the you know, after attachment and then the last um, seven months is in the fetal period and that's when it's referred to as a fetus so um, the embryonic period is interesting that short little time period because that's when all the major organs are being developed um, that's week three through week eight after conception all the major organs are developed I just think it's incredible because at this point in two weeks in pregnancy a lot of females don't even know they're pregnant so you have to be so careful when you're um, sexually active that you take care of your body because in that short period of time the organs are developed so it's the heart the lungs most importantly if if, if you will the brain uh, the spleen the the bladder the sexual organs all these things are uh, rapidly cell division is rapidly occurring and all these organs are developing in this tiny little organism that when the pregnant female does certain things to their body they don't realize how much it can affect the development of these organs and if it's something um, is developing at a certain time it's called a critical period and if the female is exposed to something harmful that harmful thing is called a teratogen and so it would be alcohol, drugs, medication, chemicals, um, high levels of stress like cortisol. These things can affect what's happening depending on what's being developed. Now, you can also, you know, look at apps and videos. Um, when I was pregnant, I had a journal and it kind of walks you along what's developing at which time, at what time in the pregnancy. And when something feels so abstract and detached especially when you're pregnant or you're, you know, um, you're with somebody who's pregnant, you don't really grasp what's occurring inside of that female body. Um, but these things are, are rapidly developing and the brain being the most important and continue to develop even after a baby is born, um, that brain needs to be protected and as healthy as it possibly can be. Because the last period, the fetal period, is all these organs going where they're supposed to go and uh, uh, the fetus becoming stronger, the, the skin becoming thicker, the external um, parts of the anatomy are now more visible. It's around 20 weeks that a lot of women get um, ultrasounds to see externally if they're having a boy or a girl. And that's if the boy or the girl is um, 
um, cooperative and you can see it with an ultrasound, but um, genetically it, it was at conception, XX or XOI, but about 20 weeks is typically around where you can see externally that coming into fruition. I don't know, have you ever asked your mom about your birth experience? Maybe you should. And probably a pretty fascinating story. Don't ask them how you got pregnant with you. They don't ask how they got pregnant with you. Ask about their, the birth experience. Because um, I have a feeling after your mom tells you about your birth experience, you might just want to thank her or buy her a car. All right, so there's a whole section on teratogens. Um, this is how I always remember it and teach it. Like, teratogens are terrible. Um, that, that's just a little uh, mnemonic to remember that these are the harmful things um, that can really cause malformation or defects in an embryo or fetus. All right, so then we have the baby, uh, the infant is born, the, the section in your book on newborn senses, what they can see, hear, taste, smell, feel, the, what is sensitive, what is continuing to develop, like their eyesight, um, some physical milestones, um, but I want to um, kind of skip past Piaget um, Piaget is a section you should definitely review on your own and, and go through the, the four stages of cognitive development. But I'm going to focus now, I'm going to end with um, something called Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. And, and what he found, he thought was very important, um, something called identity formation. So Erickson's stage, Eric Erickson and his wife, uh, were, was, were, they were both psychologists, scientists who um, studied how an individual from birth to late adulthood develops psychosocially. Um, and he believed that each age group, each section as we go through it, was associated with a drive or a conflict um, and a crisis to kind of resolve. And as you resolve these psychosocial crises, so psychologically the internal effects of behaving and thinking in a social environment, Right, this is what we're talking about, like emotions and personality and attachment. Um, these are these are the qualities that we're looking at. And he divided these, and he theorized that each stage uh, varies from um, positive to negative. Like it can be resolved in a positive way if all if most of the conditions were good, and then it can be uh, resolved in a negative way if these needs weren't met. And that the negative resolution can also trickle into the next stage which can affect lifelong personality emotional development so that's what we're going to go through so there are eight stages I'm not super used to talking about these all by myself but i will for you um so what uh, the activity that goes with the erickson stages is for you to know all eight stages the name of the stage so the life stage is the age the psychosocial conflict is the name of the stage, and that's where I'm gonna do a lot of like define those. And then you need to come up with an example of an infant who has um, expressed or learned how they learned to trust, or and then the negative conflict mistrust. So um, as I give you examples, maybe that'll make more sense. Eight stages, eight eight conflicts. All right, starting with uh, the first life stage. Infancy, um, Erickson says this was birth to 18 year, 18 months, not 18 years, 18 months. And um, that psychosocial conflict is trust versus mistrust. Now, hopefully you've read the book and you've read about attachment um, and bonding and how extremely important that is um, after um, birth and through the infancy, not just with the mother and the infant, but also the father and also um, other caregivers that the infant is exposed to. The, the more people that love and take care of and um, nurture, snuggle, feed, give medication, change diapers, um, the more p positive people in that infant's life that that infant can um, look at that person and, and realize that their being, their, their, their life is important, that they are loved, and that you can trust the people around you to take care of you. The more you have that, the more attachments, positive attachments, secure attachments you have, and um, better the emotional personality development of that infant. That infant and that emotional development that will last for the rest of their life. Because trust is at the foundation 
of every relationship successful, I should say, or, 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 um, positive relationship you have for the rest of your life. You have to trust your parents to grow up in a healthy psychological way. You have to trust that they're going to take care of your needs or the people or your caregivers or your babysitters or your grandma, whoever's in charge of meeting your needs as a, as a young baby. And then you have to trust your teachers to take care of you. Um, you have to trust a, a, another person to make a friendship. You have to trust another person to have an intimate relationship or, or have, um, close relationships with other people. Trust is the foundation of all relationships. And when you don't have that, it can be very, it can be very complicated. So Erickson said, trust is number one. Trust, um, learned through an infant, through certain examples, like having, like I said, you learn trust through having your, uh, being fed when you're hungry and, and being given medication. If you're, if you're in pain or, um, being comfortable, being snuggled, being cuddled, um, being sung to, um, being smiled at, being um, just meeting the emotional and physical needs of the baby is going to develop trust. And mistrust is when um, situations occur where it's either blatant neglect, where the mom or the caregiver, whoever's the primary caregiver, and I say that by who takes care of that child, um, is depressed or detached, um, who is an addict and cannot supply the emotional needs that that baby um, has, um, if they're physically neglectful or physically abusive, um, ignored, um, neglected, all these things can develop into mistrust in the personality of an infant. Then we get to hmm, a little before two years of age, 18 months to three years. Then you have toddlerhood and Erickson calls the stage autonomy versus doubt. So autonomy is auto is like self, um, and so our body. So they're just in that two year old to three year old stage saying and realizing they are a person separate from other people, that they are a separate entity. Um, they have needs and wants and likes and dislikes. And oh my gosh, if you've ever been around a two year old, you're going to find out those things pretty quickly. And according to Erickson, that's a good thing, a good thing to have a two year old because even their language starts to reflect their independence, their autonomy. They say, I do it myself, me do it. You know, they want to put their shoes on. They want to put their jacket on. They want to feed themselves. They, they, they just strive for that, that independence. And, and as crazy as it sounds, that's the first stage that you realize as a parent that your child, your job as a parent is to create a child that can be independent and successful and productive and happy without you. You're, that it starts at two, you know, teaching them how to be independent, teaching them how to um, think for themselves and that their opinions matter, um, you know, letting them make decisions. Hey, we got to start that at two, not 12, not 18, but it's a slow, progressive, developmental process that allows parents to realize, wow, they are not me. I am not them. So how am I going to raise them to leave me? And to, when they do leave me, when they're an adult, that, that, that they, can, they can make it on their own, not just financially, but emotionally. Okay. So two-year-olds, we're talking about them leaving us. That's kind of sad, but it happens eventually. Um, so we have this toddlerhood notion of autonomy and self and I can do it. And, and I talk to my students a lot about like, okay, how do you teach your child autonomy? It's not to say that a two-year-old gets to make their own decisions in all situations. It means that you, you set up situations so that they can start to learn to make decisions learn to have opinions. So you might, um, within a safe environment, create that like, Hey, do you want to wear this dress or this dress? Or, uh, would you like to play Play-Doh or color? I mean, instead of dictating everything for them, you start to, um, you know, put things in, in, into situations where they can start making decisions on their own. Do you want to eat chicken nuggets or, um, mac and cheese, or you want your vegetable to be broccoli or green beans? You have to eat a vegetable, but you get to pick which one. It's not letting them just decide. Children who at the same time we're creating these humans that we want to 
um, grow and develop and become independent, we also want to create boundaries at certain ages to keep them safe and to help them make decisions. So boundaries at two look a lot different than boundaries at 10 or boundaries at 16. So boundaries at two are you got to try your vegetable, but you only have to try one little bite and you get to pick which one. Um, or you need to um, get along with your sister or brother or you might make the decision to not get along and, and have a consequence. These are, these are internal processes we start to create in their brains of you, you have a, an opinion, you have a thought, but sometimes you need help making good decisions. And I'm not going to put a child in a situation where, um, hey, here's a menu of 50 things, what do you want? And they say, um, calamari and a glass of wine. No, you can't have that. So you have to create the boundaries and then let them decide. Not let them do whatever they want, but create situations where they can make decisions and be safe. That's really what it's about. And feel loved. Babies with boundaries that are appropriate and consistent feel protected and loved. And when they, if you let them do whatever they want, then they feel like life is chaotic and they don't have anybody to protect them. So um, the opposite side of autonomy is doubt. And that's when, uh, in a lot of well-intended situations where you just do everything for your kid and you tell them how to think, you tell them how to dress, you tell them what to do. Uh, you don't let them try to put their shoes on themselves. We're too big in a hurry. I'm gonna put the shoes on for you. We don't have time for you to make a decision. We just have to go, 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 because you start to give this impression to the child that their thoughts don't matter, their decisions don't matter. And even though you do know better, you're not creating a situation where they're learning to make decisions on their own. And then they have a sense of doubt. You know, um, I don't want they don't wanna make decisions when they're older. They are scared to make decisions. They doubt themselves, their abilities, their competences is very low. So you have to find that balance. It's a balance. It's not one extreme or another, it's a balance. Early childhood is three to six years. That's where we have something called initiative versus guilt. Initiative is when you have, let's say that four-year-old in preschool who wants to do things. They're just curious about learning and people and situations. They don't have that internal sense of fear and doubt. They just um, are very excited about new situations. Um, uh, children that are created, uh, are, are you create an environment of exploration and curiosity and adventure versus uh, an environment of fear and no, and you're doing it wrong. Those are our two extremes. So, um, or, or not even extreme on the, on the, the, the encouraging side, but just the, the, the negative and the positive resolution, I should say. So we have the initiative where you have your preschooler and uh, the, I always use this example of the, um, the, the guy comes into the preschool, the, or the, the woman with the wildlife stuff, like the, all the animals in the cages. And you have this little four-year-old and they're all sitting there waiting for the uh, animal, animal person to show them all the different animals. And when you see a kid with initiative around four years old is what you want to see, you know, they just look like they're going to explode. They want to touch the hedgehog or they want to see the snake or they want to see, and they might be a little hesitant, but they're like, oh, and you say, hey, who, who wants to, who wants to touch, you know, the little hissing cockroach? And touch a little, and you see that little four-year-old. They're so excited. They're so like curious. They're so they just can't wait to explore something new and fascinating. But on the flip side, and this isn't even shyness. This is a child that already has this internal sense of doubt and now guilt, uh, guilt and shame. And they're like, "Don't call me. I'm gonna break it. I'm gonna do it wrong. I can't do it." They already think they can't do things because somebody has already done all those things for them or told them they do them wrong. They don't try new artistic things. They don't try new um, uh, ways of thinking about things because they think they already have that internal voice saying they're doing it wrong and they're guilty. So um, we wanna see the kids say, oh, hokey pokey, I can't wait to, I can't wait to learn hokey pokey versus the kid that's just like, no, no, don't call on me, please. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it wrong. So seeing those things early on, encouraging a child to, to explore, because really the big picture is curiosity is learning and, and learning is, uh, an adventure and is fun when you see it as, wow, you know, I want to try this. I want to learn this. I don't want to be scared of things. I want to explore new exciting things instead of that sense of fear of not doing anything that holds you back. 
All right, then we have, so there's initiative versus guilt. Then we have middle and late childhood. Um, they, Erickson says it's industry versus inferiority. So industry is a sense of, hey, I'm good at something. Um, and it's at this age around, you know, uh, middle school, not middle school, uh, middle childhood, elementary school, where kids start to realize they might not be the best at math in their class. There's kids that are better than them, or they might not be the fastest reader, or they might not be the strongest on the, you know, in PE, or they might not have the prettiest voice in music. They start to realize that they have skills that are different from other people, and that's fine. It is the responsibility of the caretakers to find in their child what they are good at. And here's the reality. Everybody's good at something. But the reality is also that it's sometimes harder to find those things if they're not your mainstream things in an elementary school. I mean, there's more to life than just cheerleading and sports, um, which there's nothing wrong with those things. But kids um, need to f also explore other things that they're good at. Because if they don't, if they don't find that industry, that sense of being good at something, then they start to have a lot of self-doubt. They start to have uh, inferiority. They feel inferior to other people. And here's the thing. All people are smart in different ways. How are you smart? Are you, we, we have to get away from this kid's smart, this kid's not smart. Not true. There's so many ways that you can be smart. And it's, it's a good time in your life to, to help a child explore those things artistically. I remember when my nephew, um, you know, was not interested in sports and he wanted to learn to, to tap dance and his family, even though that wasn't their ideal situation at the time, they encouraged him to do what he was good at, which eventually led to his career. Um, you know, somebody might love to cook. A child might like space and exploration or robotics. Some kids might be good at um, athletics or swim or soccer. Um, so it's just, it's, there's, there's talents that are within your child or, or in a child itself. And it's about exploring those talents because you don't even have to be the best at something. The Lord knows what I was really good at, especially in third grade, talking, getting up in front of people, making people laugh. And even though I'm sometimes embarrassed, I have some of my old like conduct sheets from elementary school. She talks too much, she's disruptive. I'm so sorry. If I could go back and tell my teachers how sorry I am, I would. Um, but the good news is, is that's what I was good at. And it led me to a job. It led me into a junior high and high school um, experience where I could be on stage and I could talk to people, I could be a leader. And then it led me to a job as a professor that I'm very comfortable in front of people. And I like to motivate and talk and make people laugh. So what can sometimes seem as kind of frustrating for parents and teachers in elementary school can turn into their talents and then potentially into maybe a major or a career or a hobby. So try to find that, try to find it and nurture that in your child because it gives them a sense of industry. So I could have said, you know, this was, I was so bad at my times tables. Um, we would have like these timed practice multiplication tables and they'd say, go and do your ones and your two. And I just, I just was horrible at it. I mean, I just, just had a hard time memorizing something so abstract, so um, um, detached for, you know, a third grader. Um, and then I started looking around thinking, well, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. And I was smart, but just in a different way. So what that will allow you to do is um, have a sense of industry. When you're good at something, you can say, okay, look, hold on, my phone's blowing up. It's actually my coworkers. Um, okay. Uh, so where was I? I do this a lot, don't I get off topic. Okay, so it's the... Um, the idea that you have industry and you can say, hey, I don't have to be the best at math. I have to work at math and math is a thing that I need to learn. Or I don't have to be the best at baseball, but hey, I'm a really good singer. It buffers that self-esteem. It helps you get to what's um, known in Eric Erickson's stages as the most important stage, which is identity, which is next. So you have an industry or you have a sense of inferiority and that's pretty self-explanatory. The next one is adolescence. Um, this is identity versus role confusion. And arguably Erickson says this is the most important stage. 
Um, you know, I agree and disagree. I think all the stages build up and affect each other. Um, but the identity one is definitely very important because according to Erickson and his research, identity is to be explored during adolescence. Who am I? What are my morals? What are my values? What are my religious views? Um, what are, what is my style, my likes and dislikes, preferences, interests? And so adolescence should be a safe time to explore those things. Um, the problem with that is with that energy and that um, maybe curiosity is also a tendency for some adolescents or most adolescents not to have the uh, problem solving uh, cognitive skills to think about consequences or um, and, and potentially make, you know, d mistakes that could affect you for your lifetime. But as long as you have some some kind of boundaries, adolescence should be a part of being you. Find out who you are. What is your taste in music? What is your um, what do you like to do? And so these things are explored and, and changed almost to where, again, if we had um, a timeline of pictures of you from sixth grade to uh, 20, um, then your style might change and your, your, your taste in music changes and how you decorate your room changes and the, the people you choose to hang around with even at the same time you know not so good people good people you know who are you and this is a part of that journey and it's hard for parents and it's hard for me to allow my children to explore this and not worry about um, potential negative consequences but to a certain degree that's needed we can't be these helicopter parents that dictate everything it's very similar to having a toddler but you know tell our children to have experiences where they have to use critical thinking so identity is um, the the struggle if you will during adolescence um, and it is um, really taking everything that you have learned through your parents and your morals and values and schooling and experiences to create um, your unique self, your identity. And it's a process. And it's not like you get to 18 and go, oh, I'm done. I'm, I'm, you know, stick a fork in it. I'm just completely uh, developed personality wise. It is an ongoing process throughout the lifespan, but your, um, your, your, your main focus in this time period, according to um, Erickson is to, to explore that identity. And I feel very lucky. Um, I'm not sure how I did with my own children. I feel very lucky that I grew up in a time um, during adolescence where um, I could make mistakes that were not permanent or um, life, you know, altering in a negative way where I could, you know, paint my room or decorate things in my room the way I wanted to, wear what I wanted to, even though I looked ridiculous. Um, I should seriously um, show you a picture. Hold on a second. I apologize ahead of time if this is traumatizing. Um, but in the 80s, and uh, as a teenager, I was exploring my identity. I want to show you some of the most embarrassing things because I'm okay with that. Look at this. Look at this. What is going on there? I don't... It's, it's, it's embarrassing. But if you look through um, some of the things on this page... Uh, Fashion choices, uh, friendship choices, big hair, big hair don't care. What was I thinking? Wait, what is that? I mean, I look like a normal human here, but I look like a crazy human here and here. Um, I don't know. What I'm just trying to say is, um, oh, this one, oh, the big hair. Look at that hair. Can you see this? hair what is happening I don't know I, I still feel like I have big hair anyway I think my point is um I was a, a punk rocker and a cheerleader and uh and a rebel and a church goer and had bad friends and good friends and listened to all kinds of music and 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 what my mom would probably say to this day is a really good guardian angel but at least I had the opportunity to um figure out who I was because by the time I got to college, um, a lot of the stupid stuff I did when I was younger, it was just not important to me. I was ready to be an adult. I was ready to explore uh, relationships in a different way and spend my time doing things like live music and, and museums and travel. I just had been able to do some of the dumb 
temporary personality things um, in adolescence so that I could get to a point uh, that I could get to the next stage of my life, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, role confusion is um, not forming an identity, forming the identity uh, based on another person or your parents. Okay, I'm somebody's girlfriend, or I'm somebody's boyfriend, or I'm some, you know, I belong in this uh, group, or, you know, to the extreme, a gang, or bad friends identify you uh, and tell you who you are. Or you say, um, I'm not even going to pick what I want to do. Um, my family has told me my whole life I was going to be a professional bowler, and I'm going to be a professional bowler because why not? That's what everybody in my family does. So it is not being able to explore that and figure it out on your own. It's set for you, or either through parents or society, or um, relationships you have with friends and dating relationships and things like that. Um, after, on the opposite side of identity is that role confusion. Um, and it can come in different forms, but it's just not knowing who you are. And um, what happens after identity in young adulthood, according to um, Erickson, is something called intimacy. So it's the cliche of uh, know who you are before you, um, you know, join with somebody else, especially to spend your life with. Um, uh, figure out who, what your likes, dislikes, wants, needs are, and then you bring it into a relationship and have what's considered healthy intimacy. Intimacy is not just in a um, romantic relationship. It can be um, with friendships where you're close to another person, you trust them, you're vulnerable. Um, intimacy is not uh, necessarily sexual. It's just a connection with other people. But, but Erickson says you can't have a good, strong, pure connection unless you know who you are. Um, hopefully you can't hear the mowing in the background, but whatever. Um, then uh, the opposite side of intimacy is isolation. And so according to Erickson, if you skip the stage of finding out who you are, you can physically be around other people, but still feel very alone, still very, feel very um, confused and isolated. Um, and I've talked to students in the past who say, and who love their parents very much, but see that maybe within their parents as they got married so young that their mom really didn't get to explore their uh, a career or their, their passions. Um, uh, they became somebody's wife and mother and maid or, you know, uh, somebody's caretaker before they were really able to explore their identity and therefore um, they felt kind of isolated in their later years. So um, this isn't always the case in every situation, but this is what Erickson says, identity, knowing who you are before you um, join with somebody else, then you make them better and they make you better if you're able to figure out those things during that adolescence, young adulthood time. So intimacy uh, versus isolation. Intimacy is just being close. Um, and that's an emotional closeness. Middle adulthood is generativity versus stagnation. And um, according to Erickson, and after you've experienced healthy intimacy and connection, then generativity is the time in your life where you um, generate new ideas, uh, learn new behaviors, give back to other people, and grow. Um, I think a, a, a problem with middle adulthood is people um, not growing, not learning and pushing themselves and continue to be um, the, their, the best version of themselves either through work or family or personal health growth, whatever, relationship growth. But generativity means to generate, to, um, to, to do something, to achieve something, to uh, make a difference, to be productive, to um, learn and and that's opposed to stagnation. So stagnation could be middle adulthood where um, you don't change, you don't grow, uh, you don't evolve as a person into a better version of yourself. Um, generativity could be taking classes and um, growing um, or becoming a grandparent and mentoring. Um, stagnation could be um, doing the same thing every day you know, not growing in your job, not doing anything different in your life, and just kind of hitting the repeat button. Um, Groundhog Day, if you will, and uh, your days and your weekends look the same, and you're waiting for something, but sometimes retirement or a change, but um, it can be stagnant. So it can be very uh, depressing. It can be very, um, uh, well, the opposite of growth. It can be very... Um, 
unfulfilling. Uh, so then you have the last stage, which is late adulthood, uh, ego integrity versus despair. And psychosocially, what that looks like is integrity is just living your best life um, throughout all the stages, getting to the end of your life and having a sense of um, uh, satisfaction and um, connection. Integrity at late adulthood would be um, somebody where I'm always just so blown away and proud of my students. And you have a 50-year-old in your class who's going back to be a nurse. I mean, maybe she wasn't able to do that in her 20s, but she's going to live her life with integrity and do what she, she set out to do, even if it's a little bit harder, if it's not considered, you know, um, socially what everybody else is doing. They're going to reach their goals. They're going to mend uh, relationships that are uh, dysfunctional or change dysfunctional relationships. You're going to connect to people. You're going to have something at the end of your life. Ego integrity is going to be that thing at the end of your life where you said, I did something important, uh, something positive. It's, it has nothing to do with living your life to accumulate stuff or money or materialism, it's connections. I mean, as morbid as it sounds, integrity is when you can live your life and die knowing that you loved others fiercely and completely, that the people you love knew that you loved them, that you made them a priority, that you will be missed, that you made a difference in, in lives. This is ego integrity. Um, so the opposite of that would be despair. And that's, it's, despair. <laughs> it is somebody getting to their less, the end of their life with regrets, with, with low, with, without social connections, without making a positive difference, with that selfishness kind of internalizing as I didn't get to do what I wanted to do, or this life wasn't what I would have chosen, or I wouldn't do it the same. Um, it's depressing. It is um, despair and it's regrets. So I say, and I've always said, I mean, uh, I sometimes quote a, um, Eric Erickson with using a, a, or not quote Eric Erickson, I use a, a movie called Shawshank Redemption. There's a part in it. Um, if you haven't seen it, you have to see Shawshank Redemption. But um, where the character says, get busy living or get busy dying. So there's a time in your life where you either grow and, and evolve and become a better person person of, and the best person you can be to make the biggest positive difference or what are you planning for your retirement your death your funeral you you have a certain finite amount of time to make a difference and in erickson stages when you live your life with integrity and guys integrity is today you don't wait till late adulthood to live your life with integrity to do what you said you were going to do to do the right thing to do the right thing when nobody's looking to do the things that connect you to other people those things are integrity that are infused in your entire life. So if, God forbid, you pass tomorrow, then somebody says they lived their life with integrity. They did what they said they were going to do. They made certain things important that they said that were important. They met their responsibilities. They achieved their goals. These are all things surrounded with integrity. So my big message is don't wait till late adulthood to, to search for integrity. Live your life that way because when the end of your life comes, then you know that you did the best you could. You made mistakes. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes, but you mend them and you, and you fix things that are broken and you, and you um, prioritize important relationships every day is the day to live with integrity. So you get to the end of your life and you don't have regrets. And even though you will be severely missed, then you know that the people that you um, came in contact with and the people that loved you will be impacted by your life for the rest of your life. So that's the goal. So that's all I'm gonna cover in chapter nine. Um, there's some, again, videos on the adolescent brain and things like that, but that's all we're gonna cover. Today. So thanks for sticking with me. Hopefully you were looking at the PowerPoints. Hopefully this wasn't too goofy. Hopefully the lawn mowing equipment in the background wasn't distracting. So make it a good one. Thanks.